approach is organized by Presentation House Gallery, uh, curated by John Goodman. And uh, Mary Rice, she'll be leading the tour, and she's an associate professor at the University of British Columbia and a local artist and writer. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Um, thanks for coming out. I don't know how long this is going to be. I, I'm not very good at figuring out how I'm going to proceed. I'm just going to kind of wing it. I've got some notes in case I get lost in my head or nervous or anything. Um, I'm sure that will happen. But um, So I guess I, I want to start here, where these two live in. Um, I'm not going to give any bio information about about um, about Mara Baby. Um, I think you can do that yourself. I'm going to talk mostly about the work and the framework around the work. And um, but I thought I'd start with these two linen uh, print paintings. They, I think they're a silk screen. Um, so what I want to point out is are the dates. I don't know if anybody's given any thought to the dates or looked into it at all. Has anybody done that? Put your hand up. We can have a conversation. I'm kind of hoping that maybe it could be more conversational. If you have information that I don't know about, that would be really great for everybody. Um, so I would like you to keep that in mind. Um, these prints were were printed by other people, Esther Kruger and the person escapes me. Um, why they're printed by two different people, I also don't know. There are many. The, I guess the point that I would like to start with is that there are many um, puzzles uh, to kind of put together uh, mysteries to unlock within the show. Um, and initially what I wanted to do with this uh, exhibition was just go through the work and respond to it, but it's virtually impossible due to the um, you know, erudite and, and heavy kind of uh, quoting and um, referencing that goes on in the exhibition. So um, we'll, I just want you to think about these dates, 1947 to 1730, which do not correspond to the show that's going on at the time that it's here, obviously. So um, from here, I'd like to go towards where the piano is. And, um, and then that's kind of a good place to start in terms of talking about how the show is conceptualized. I guess I'd like to start by, I'd like to um, read out a quote. And it's something from the index cards in Maury Davies uh, collection. Um, it's a little bleak, but I think that it, it gives an opening onto um, the kind of honesty and urgency that you feel in your work. Um, you must write as if you're already dead. And that's um, originally from Nadine uh, Gordimer. And it's something that I came across a few years ago as well. And um, what I like about the quotation is that it, I think that there's so much posturing, oftentimes there's so much posturing, so much fear around being honest in the art and coming across as super intellectual or distant or sophisticated, that sometimes we lose touch of the fact that if you were to just make work as if you were already dead, or write as if you were already dead, um, things would come out that, um, that would speak to that urgency to, uh, I guess, wanting to make sense of um, an ulterior meaning, a kind of element of truth in, in our immediate reality. And also the brutal honesty that can come out if you're not worried about what people think of you. I mean, obviously there are limits to that, but um, I was really taken by that. And um, I think that uh, we're, I think in terms of Mary David, too, the pace and the kind of um, melancholy that's in the work, um, it really, the, and the pacing of the video, uh, the, the kind of quietness of a lot of the scenes really are a constant reminder that when you look at work that we don't really have that much time. And it's also something that's picked up by Boris Royce in one of his essays. Um, this idea that there is no time, that we feel like we're running out of time all the time, that we're in a rush, that time is precious, and that we just don't have time to slow down. And I think that what her work does is it forces us to slow down and think about um, things that might uh, be overlooked in terms of our immediate lives. The overlook being a key word also in her practice. And, um, and so what her work, I think, does is that despite this, this sense of time constraint, it really does force us to slow down and take the time. It's two and a half hours worth of video, right, that you have to um, sit through. But it's, it's entirely compelling. It go, it, the, the work is, um, is so full of references and so full of kind of narrative, um, non-linear perambulations through her life and through the life of books. I mean, so much of the life of books becomes a part. She cannibalizes, you know, ideas, books, 
painting, um, art, um, music as a way to um, make sense of her life and construct it as well. So um, I think that her work reflects a, a different economy of making art, especially in terms of photography. Her, uh, her desire has always been to continue with the analog uh, practice, despite the fact that she did take a bit of time uh, away from photography at a time when she was uh, feeling, I guess, a certain kind of lull in her practice and turned to a video as a way of reigniting her excitement, as well as writing, reigniting that excitement around thinking about photography and what its purpose is in her, um, in her life and in the life of um, historical memory. So um, I guess this, this exhibition uh, presents a bit of a retrospective, but a selection of particular works based on connections between works. And they aren't at all um, clear initially. So um, it was undertaken as a collaboration um, with John Goodwin, her, um, her gallerist, her and um, in Toronto, and they've been working since 1993. So there are samples of projects that she's worked with him throughout that time. And um, it, it also should have reflects the collaboration with other artists, such as the painting behind you, Elizabeth McIntosh, which I have to admit, I, I'm not entirely sure about um, the, the meaning behind it, but I think it lends a certain, um, definitely a certain kind of emotional intensity to the show. If, if people have had a conversation with Elizabeth McIntosh and they know anything about it, then please intervene. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes, of course. So, one of the things when I first saw the show was I was wondering who that was behind. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering, uh, you wouldn't know the answer directly, but there's no labels here. So I just assumed it was her or some kind of experiment. Any thoughts on that? Well, the part of um, there is an edition of the um, sheet with all the works on it at the front where that kind of red safe flag is on the pedestal in front where the video is. So it tells you all the artists and all the, and quite exhaustively all the elements to the show. So I guess that's how you're supposed to figure it out. And there's also no essay, which really adds this other layer of mystery. And I, I think some people are genuinely frustrated by not understanding enough of the show. And in a way, the video unlocks a lot of that, um, the, the meaning that is hidden within the works. Um, yeah, I'm not, I think that part of, this is, this is where you're supposed to kind of go to too, and there's a lot of her essays are in within, within a lot of these, and, and books that she's written, at, um, books she's edited on motherhood. I don't know if it's here. I think it is. This is a beautiful book which I've been distributing. Um, Problems of reading, and um, yeah, it's a good question. It's, um, I didn't ask for that. That was definitely a, a strategy um, part of the curator was to, in a way, make you start unraveling <coughs> your own sense of how you're making meaning as you're moving around and not be, you know, not have an explanation that's utterly clear. And, and what's important is the, la the label copy is also handwritten by Maura. Like, every part of that was very intentional, that it's these, these different, and also the different sense of time um, as you're kind of deciphering things, and no, we weren't uh, we weren't allowed to put up a didactic panel. So that was I like that element of the handwriting is kind of time wasted, <coughs> or just that element of the artist's hand, or is that was that the curator's hand? No, that's definitely that's the artist's hand, yeah. and very similar to Robert Balser's. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the Elizabeth Mackintosh painting too was related to uh, the curator's relationship to that artist and then his sense of time with Moira. <coughs> so it's these interlocking kinds of narratives. Yes. Yeah, so his presence is really quite um, quite large in the show, even though we, we tend to maybe not think about it. Um, and so I did I did contact Moira about uh, about the title of the show and those dates. And I did, I did figure out the dates based on the fact that there is this kind of uh, memorial plaque um, that it is uh, to a, a woman from the 17th century, um, and her name is uh, Jael uh, Godolphin, um, and her, uh, not much is known about her, she's a bit of a mystery, but this wonderful plaque was, um, was made for her, and it's outside uh, a church in Kensington, I think. And, um, and it, it, it 
speaks about her in terms of the complexity of her mind, uh, how much she was admired, and uh, her generosity, amongst other qualities. And, and I think, um, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown about how the show began. Uh, Moira says that it was a result of a long conversation between her and John Goodwin. And it started with, with Goodwin's fascination around the contradictions of for, for, former mayor um, New York's, of New York City, Ed Koch. So Ed Koch is, uh, there are about four different representations here amidst other, in, um, other representations of, uh, of the Trinity Cemetery in New York City, up in, in Washington Heights, just behind Moira's um, building where she lives. And so when he found out that um, he was buried there behind her place, he said, well, take photographs of it. And, um, and then, so, so he was fascinated and despised um, Kosh because he, uh, he ignored the AIDS crisis at the time. And he was also, um, he also changed the date of his birth by 18 years. So there was something around that. Um, yeah, so he was, he was kind of fascinated by the contradictions within the mayor, and when he, and then um, afterwards, oh yeah, and then what he wrote on there, yeah, here, it's my father's Jewish, my mother's Jewish, I am Jewish, and those are um, the words of Daniel Pearl before he was beheaded, so there's this kind of element of um, obscenity there, I guess, I don't know. Um, he was fascinated by that. And then uh, Hurricane Sandy hit in 2012, hence all the fallen trees. And so she took photographs um, in the aftermath. And when um, Goodwin asked for a title of the show, she chose Ornament and Reproach because within um, the uh, stone marker here, it says at one point that uh, she was admired and revered by all as well as her relations as being confessedly the ornament and at the same time the tacit reproach of a wicked age. And um, where was Moira uh, Davies was saying that uh, she's had long conversations um, and memories of this with her husband and they talk about it often. They're very touched by the memorial and so she decided to name it after that. Um, so it was Goodwin's idea to dig up all this history with, around that memorial as well as the um, grave stone and um, he was asking her to take photographs uh, in light of the burial and the tombstone being there in light of the um, Hurricane Sandy and what he would do is he would put the images that she sent him on a piano, either around the piano or on the ledge there, and he would improvise while he was looking at it. So the reason why the piano is here has a lot to do with that, um, that element of their history together, how he would respond to her work through music. And then after that, uh, um, Davies, or I don't know if it was Goodwin or Davies, um, commissioned a piece by David Lang, and he uh, he um, immediately gravitated to the word ornament, which is um, originated in the Baroque period, and so used the idea of ornament within the piece itself. And so all of those kind of loose ideas, or rather interconnected ideas, um, are you know encapsulated in this as a conversation between them. Uh, so I guess in, in Washington Heights, in the park where Trinity um, Cemetery is, uh, in the summertime it turns into this jungle and there are invasive species, including parrots and cacti, all kinds of foreign plants. And so she wanted to, she was fascinated by this, and it's also photographs included that in there, I, I assume, for that reason. And um, I, was, I, I was looking at this quotation here. L'écrivain paix de sa personne, um, in French, meaning the writer pays with his or her person. Um, so this idea of expenditure, um, wasted kind of time, losing yourself 
in the act of creation. I oh, thought was very, very interesting way to the work that is alongside to the idea of pain. Um, and I think that that also, it reflects on this life that's completely uh, dedicated to an artistic practice. If, if you spend time looking at um, Moira Daly's work in the video, especially all of her work is coming out of her domestic environment. Well, not all of it. She does venture out, but uh, it does begin in the home, her still life um, series of work that was um, made through the 90s and 2000s was dominated by interiors and um, you can see it throughout the uh, bottle series and um, sorry I'm losing track of what I was just talking about just a second ago <laughs> uh, and oh yeah so I, I guess we can have a, can have a bit of a conversation about um, about what you think about the folded posters, because that's another thing that um, started because of, of Goodwin. So, um, so John Goodwin, I, I'm not sure what year it was, but Mario Davey was going to have a show, and he said, he had this idea, he said, um, well, why don't you uh, take photographs, I think it was while she was in Paris, and uh, why don't you send them to me folded for the show? And then when they arrived, he unfolded them and he put them up in the grid. So that they became this kind of folded poster um, grid photographs. And, and I, I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on the aesthetic. I mean, it's, it's also in the new series of, um, of the uh, Copperheads as well. This is a revisiting of a work that she became famous for uh, in about 1990, I believe. Uh, she, she printed off a of, of hundred different copperheads of Lincoln and um, of the penny, the most devalued currency, and then she revisited it uh, a year or two ago for another show and did 100, 101 to 200 copperheads. Um, so, yeah, there's something about the photograph that's rather irreverent, I think, the way that she, she treats the photograph itself, and I think it was a way of her getting back into photography after a time of um, where she was feeling exhausted by the lack of ideas that she was having around it, and also in light of the fact that uh, photography's trend was towards larger um, and very colorful and high-end photographs within the market. So I don't know if you have any. I think it's interesting with um, the relationship to the memorial and the penny and the similarity and that the penny being this really transient or mobile uh, object and so she's kind of turned the, like, the tombstone or that kind of memorial into a transient mobile thing by mailing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. And then the, the idea that's being handled is being yeah, handled yeah, yeah. that it's getting dirty. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then, the, and then the patina on there, like the gouging on a lot of the surface, and then the, just the, the kind of decay. And then it turns into kind of landscape, and then she says, landscape introduced sort of sandwich with all the Yeah, I remember during her talk, someone um, was talking about how they were asking what, they, what she thought that, the, uh, that those, those formalist elements of the tape, you know, the kind of punctuation, of the color tape was distracting at all. And initially, I really didn't even know what they were because I hadn't seen the work yet, and I was just seeing it from on the screen from far back. And I thought that, uh, and I had, had clued in that it would have been the tape that was doing that. I thought it was just some kind of strange abstract um, idea that she had. But then I realized very quickly um, that it was because it had been folded and taped. And that taping mechanism gets. It was, I think, originally uh, visited in her 1993 piece, uh, Money Box, where she has a, a $10 note sealing the box itself. We could go look at it. We could talk about money some more. And the idea that it's dirty, right? The idea that the money is really dirty and it, and it does have a kind of psychoanalytic, um, in the psychoanalytic discourse, it's, 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 uh, it's, you know, it, it's dealt with in terms of the kind of penal detention. Uh, it's associated with shit, 
And, um, and then I was thinking, when I was looking at them, that, okay, where are other areas that I've seen the oxidation before, and I was thinking of um, the piss paintings by, by Warhol, and the idea of um, that the handling of it is creating, but I don't know, it's just, that, it's just the age of the painting is basically doing that, other than anything else, but, um, so this is a, a, quite a um, complex uh, intersection of ideas that is between um, these plates, these metal plates, um, are taken out of the box and there are slots within the box. And so I, uh, when, when, when John Goodwin was, um, he was the, I guess, curator for, um, he, he, he was curator of, of printed matter. Is, is it a curator? Is there? Yeah, yeah right. was director, the director, the director of, of printed matter. Um, so that was one of the first times I think she worked with, with John Goodwin and she produced this box. And the images on it, does anybody know what the images are from? They're these little kind of flown types with canes. And you don't know if they're rich or poor or what, but they're just kind of hanging around. Yeah, they're from the money. Yeah, so the US Treasury is um, depicted on the $10 note. And so what she's done is she's magnified it the same way that she magnified the Lincoln uh, pennies. And um, I don't know why you call it a link penny. <laughs> and uh, and then I, I, you know, then they have this kind of brown cast to them, which uh, probably has a lot to do with the kind of process, um, photographic process that was used in order to transfer it onto the middle plate. But it does have this kind of brown cast, which I think is significant in my mind, anyway. Um, and then it's been sealed by the ten uh, ten dollar note. Uh, ten dollar bill, sorry. And um, I think what, what, what is included in it is a state is a is a writing, and this is a really the, it's it's worth reading. She she goes through um, a, uh, a passage from Virginia Woolf's A Room of View, uh, no, A Room of Her Own, sorry, A Room of One's Own, sorry, <laughs> and she talks about how um, Virginia Woolf was. Very, felt very comforted by the fact that she had received an inheritance and she could always have two $10 notes in her purse for the rest of her life. And then she goes on to talk about the gambler wanting to lose everything or thinking that if I win something it's because, um, you know, father is, is, is on my side or something like that. So the idea that, you know, he wins to lose always in order to thwart the father figure um, in a nutshell, that's what she's saying, and then she, there's this last detail where she talks about uh, Walter Benjamin and his fascination with um, with the, the decorations, all the kind of cupids and frolicking around uh, around um, dollar bills and notes and ornamenting um, the, the most of the dollar bills and the, and the margins. And, and where they is saying, um, you know, this surprises me because all I can think about with money is how banal it is. Uh, another, I don't know if it's from here, plus she mentioned the potlatch too, yeah, she talks about potlatch and the alternative economy of, of um, you know, of giving everything away and uh, throwing coppers into the ocean in order to, um, you know, waste it all or to, um, be in competition with one's rivals, and the idea that you um, people will always be in beholden to you if you are shown to be able to give and um, excessively and expend. So there are these different elements that are um, dealt with, and then there are the, the gloves. They look quite dirty as well, um, and then a variety of different um, mailers from previous shows, shows they've done together. Uh, this is also quite curious. You have to look uh, into the letter that would be inserted inside each of these envelopes, and um, it, you, you come to, to understand what those envelopes are when you look at the video uh, called 50 Minutes. 50 Minutes is a video where mm -hmm. that um, there are about a few intersecting narratives. One is 50 minutes being uh, the time that she spends with her psychoanalyst. And 
Uh, I, she has many comments throughout the video of her frustrations with her analysts, and she picks them apart. And she thinks that his couch and his whole setup is really tacky and is kind of, you know, um, tantric Freud. And so she's she's quite disgusted with him at one point. Anyway, he um, he charges her because he's finish, finishing his uh, training in his practice. He only charges her eight dollars an hour, which is based on what her income would be. And, um, and so each of these envelopes, her retaining the receipt um, of you know, what she spent. So there's a certain amount of email retention there. <laughs> kind of interesting too. And then I was thinking about how that creeps into the fridge piece, which I think you should look at because it's quite, quite funny. There's humor in your work. So 50 minutes, it, it deals with um, Time she spent, I think it's five or six years she spent going uh, into town, uh, you know, and having analysis with this, uh, with Dr. Y, she calls him, five days a week, and then when she gets, when she has her child, she cuts it down to one or two times a week, and then he ends up expecting her to spend more time with him, and that's when she cuts off the analysis. Um, but it goes on for five or six years. And then the other element of 50 minutes is um, the anxiety around post, the post-9-11 post moment. She starts shooting footage of the film in um, 2002, and it doesn't end up getting completed in 2006. And she, but she really only deals with it through the writings of Natalia, of, of Vivian Bornick, who writes about uh, writers like Anna Akhmatova and Natalia Ginsburg um, when they're describing kind of war torn Europe and the aftermath. And so she's always dealing with really emotional and um, really emotional issues through other writers, especially in terms of 9-11. I think that was um, particularly a good strategy on her part. Um, and um, Anyways, there's a scene in very early on in the in, in 50 minutes where she talks about her fridge as a source of anxiety, and it's 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 riveting just hearing her talk about it. Uh, the pleasures she sees in the contents of the fridge diminish. The spaces that open up between food items as it gets used and widening, like a carcass being eaten by maggots, like the scene from Greenaway's I said two knots. She goes through this, and it's just wonderful. And then, and then, so, so some of that re, kind of anal retention ends up cropping up in this um, in this photograph called Glad. And so it's Glad, and so this is kind of pleasure. And and then you start seeing things like the colon cleanse, the um, you know Gary the plumber, it's funny plumbing, um, what to eat, uh, solid waste collection management. So there are all these, and then this almost looks like. Um, a toilet that you'd kind of flush. The, the flush. And, um, and there's a little bit of art in the front, which is. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and then there's always kind of fiber rich food <laughs> on top. So it, it, it ends up adding this kind of still photographic element to the story around the fridge, which she ends up flashing up at one point very briefly within um, that section of the. Of the um, of the video, and um, okay, where am I? Fifteen minutes. Oh yeah, and she admits how. Very, I mean, she she does. The thing with the video is is that there's so much research. It's almost like she's more comfortable doing research and talking about her love of books and her love of reading than she is of um, disclosing anything about her life. But it does become an excuse to come to terms with certain things in her life. Um, and so she does it always via these, uh, these other writers or ideas around psychoanalysis or you know, any number of um, stories. She admits at one point that the prime source of conflicts with her partner is around him cooking large quantities of food and stuffing the fridge with it. Um, she says, that, and she admits that her miserly and obsessive tendencies vis-a-vis -vis the fridge can be, could be interpreted as a way of controlling destiny at a very mundane level. There are some really 
um, really prominent motifs that I've probably talked about already, but I could, I could mention. And uh, maybe I could um, just read out a few quotes. I've been reading a bit of a writing. There's a uh, the one that I pointed out with the problems of reading, and then uh, like in one of the books, maybe the white. What's it called? It is in this book called Long Life Full White. Right in there. There's a essay called Notes on Photography and Accident. And so the accident and the idea of the overlooked um, are central to her interest in photography. Um, so the accidental, um, the desire to fix the fleeting trace, the memento mori, the photo is memento mori, um, as well as the punctum and the photograph, the unexpected and the surreal are things that she retains and she continues to um, be interested in. I think regardless of the fact that some people might say, well, you know, that's been done. Um, you know, we, we, uh, photography is too dominant and it needs to stay contemporary, but um, these are, she, she, writes, she writes about photography in order to deal, I think, with um, many issues. I think one of them is analog, uh, analog photography's uh, relationship to the archive and, and recollection um, in a time of historical amnesia, uh, also making sense of one's life um, over time, the idea of death, and, and then her illness, I think, probably had, has a lot to do with a lot of her work. Um, this, these photographs of the bottles came about, I read, I think, in one, of, in one of the books there, I can't remember which one, that it came about when she got to the end of a, a roll of film and she had accidentally taken a photograph of a bottle and it was kind of doubled. It, was, it looked like double vision, and so she was, she was quite surprised by how great it looked and how it spoke to the, um, the importance of altered states of consciousness and to being open to the accident within artistic practice. So it was almost as if it was speaking to the very nature of photography as um, you know, one of the impulses and one of the passions she has is for the accidental within the work. And, uh, and then it speaks to the idea of um, the altered state of consciousness that allows you to tap into the creative mode. Um, the other one being reading, idly, um, walking, being a flowner. Um, she speaks in her film Les Godes about um, substance abuse of her youth, and um, obviously she's interested in, in Benjamin and Heshish in terms of the flowner as well. Um, so this series of photographs came out of that accident of finding that negative and thinking about what a, an incredible, fortuitous um, find it was. And she thinks a lot about photography as this kind of found moment um, rather than something that's constructive, something that, that comes out of the real quite unexpectedly. And um, I haven't quite come to understand the reasoning, nor do I. I need to, I don't think, about the, the kind of diptych uh, verticality of it. Um, and then she's also made the poster of, um, of, the, of the bottles within you know, a domestic setting and always a, a somewhat cluttered and untidy place. I mean, dust and clutter and too many books and all that is a big part of her aesthetic. It's really about depicting um, the life of the creative mind. And, um, and then this work is also in book form. It is in book form, yeah. <coughs> is it here? Yeah, yeah. And it's for sale. <laughs> right, sorry. There are so many books that I don't always retain all of that. <laughs> it is for sale. <laughs> okay, so I thought I'd, I'd read out a few, um, a few quotations from notes on uh, photography and accident. Because it really, it, because she meditates on the same writers over and over again in this in this uh, essay, and um, it points to how she was trying to come to terms with her lack of productivity, her, her artist block, and so she starts out the essay um, with three writers in particular, or 
four, I should say. And then I threw in a couple of other quotations that I thought were really uh, interesting in light of her use of photography as um, intrinsic to the, 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 the uh, qualities that are intrinsic to the materiality of the photograph being really about the subject matter that she's choosing. Walter Benjamin. The viewer of the photograph feels an irresistible compulsion to seek the, the tiny spark of accident, the here and now. Susan Zontag. Most photographers have always had an almost superstitious confidence in the lucky accident. Janet Malcolm. All the canonical works of photography retain some trace of the medium's underlying, life-giving, accident proneness. And then Roland Barthes. Pumpkin, the thing that casts the cast of the dice, that accident which pricks. Gary Winogrand, uh, what makes a picture alive instead of dead? And then Moira Davy, um, later on in, in her essay, uh, talks about the appeal, the kind of photograph that she's attracted to. She says, to those artists already mentioned, Peter Kushar, Zoe Leonard, Terry James Marshall, David um, Wynarovich, um, Francesca Goodman. I'll take the opportunity to add here Liz Deschain, Yitka Hanselova, Hannah Leiden, Claire Pentecost, James Welling. In these artists, I intuit wholly from the gut a love for the aged and the yellowed, what Barth unabashedly in his essentialism about photographs identified in a 1979 lecture as the real photography unlike the glossy pictures of Patty Match. So that gives you an idea of um, the kind of photography that she is going for. Uh, an avoidance of the grand tableau and the ever larger color prints. Um, they're all always modest in scale, understated, the subjects are always very raw. Um, there are even some dirty prints that you'll see, the one just around the corner being a print that was shown at Presentation House, I think, in 87. And so there's, there's kind of this, there's a certain reference that continues on from this project to even saying, okay, well, I'm going to show those despite the fact that there are glitches, there are little things that are not quite right with them. There's a certain dirty surface or imperfection. And it also carries through into the money. Um, and above all, she's, uh, she's known for the spareness of her work, the archival impulse, the kind of accretion, collection of the everyday as a way of dealing with um, the stuff in our lives that accumulate, but also the fact that she doesn't dispose of them, that in a way she thinks that it's all really up for grabs in terms of um, marking the time through wasting time drinking community created. Um, and uh, let's see. Another thing that I, I really admire is her um, is that she's I mean it comes through in the title of the exhibition, the prominence of women within all of her work. Uh, the women that she quotes throughout the videos. And um, her video called Les Gades, I don't know if it's on right now, should we just go take a peek to see what's on and then... Initially, the focus is on uh, hand-carved books, stone, stone carving of books. And her work is always, always has these intertitles that describe in some way it's going to be um, revealed um, so, can I see? Oh, yeah, so, it, it, so there's, you know, let me just get to the section here. So, interspersed with <laughs> these moments in cemeteries, she has two other things going on. <coughs> um, the, she interviews, she asks, she's in the interview, she asks many of her friends, and family members, artist friends, writers, um, to interpret a letter by Walter Benjamin to Gershom Scholem. And it takes place at a time when Walter Benjamin has just installed himself in a new apartment. 
He's uh, quite desperately poor. He has to rent the furniture. He doesn't have a desk. He ends up having to write while he's lying on a couch, which is made for a paralytic woman. So it's not even a comfortable couch he can relax on. It's, you know, so he has to write on this. And then he says, and the ultimate thing is I have this view outdoors where I can see all the skaters on the lake and is overlooking this, um, this square. And he said, and then there's the town clock just outside the window, and it's a luxury I cannot do without. Something to that effect. And so she asks um, her friends and family members to interpret what this means, especially the part about the clock. What does it mean that this clock is a luxury that he can't do without? And so she, um, everyone has a very different answer. And, and I think she comes to the conclusion by the end that um, and no, I don't. I don't know. I don't think there's anything that's conclusive. But what I what I see as essential to that moment, where there's this kind of need for the outside, the window, as this kind of added luxury that he doesn't pay for, but is kind of built into the rent. And I think that that idea of the outside is what was what really brought her outside of the in interior domestic realm, which is where she was focusing her video and, and photography practice, towards going out in the street. And then from there, she was using herself and her own body within the videos, something that is quite enigmatic, because she could have just used a voiceover. But the fact that she's always walking, you know, she sets up a camera somewhere in the room, she's walking back and forth, she's talking, she's got this kind of audio prompter in her ear that, um, is reading out what she's reciting in um, in real time. So this is kind of the enigma around why is she using her body? Why is why is it so awkward? Why is it kind of artless? Everything's kind of you know shifty and out of focus and and you know a little bit abrupt at times. Um, but I do think that she's in this film as well as, this is 2009, and in, in Big Audess from 2011, she's bringing, bringing the figure back into her practice at a time where she, you know, she's questioning all of that um, identity politics and Marxist theory around um, the, the unethical nature of portraying the body, and especially the female body. And in Big Audess, she brings out these photographs She's showing these photographs while she's recounting stories about um, Mary Wollstonecraft and her daughters, Mary Shelley, um, Fanny Imlay, and Claire Claremont. And she's making a juxtaposition between the photographs of her and her sisters and her friends, Martha Rossler and you know, Alice Cooler talking about how you know that's really not um, an ethical thing to do, you, you know, you're, you're, you're stealing their soul, you're, you're, you're taking advantage of them, you're becoming this kind of parachute artist. So she, she turns to it, she's coming to terms with her own past, her own addiction, her sister's addictions, um, her family in general, um, and she only bleakly touches on her family life um, and talks, I guess, about how tumultuous it probably really, really was through the lens of Mary Shelley and company. So um, I, I suggest you look at it because I was, I, was really, I was really taken by the photographs and thinking, wow, you're really digging up this side of yourself that, you probably, that most people would probably really want to hide. And I, and I, and I, and I, I guess I, 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 I love her work because I've been um, questioning a lot of these things myself uh, ideas around honesty and art, um, the, uh, yeah, what's good to do, what's not good to do, and, and, I, and I think that she does it in a, in a really, um, a really smart way, and, and uh, that's not really good to end off, so. <laughs> does anybody watch these and have any? Thoughts or questions? Well, they do seem like home <coughs> movies. Yeah. The best sense of the word, the casualness, and as you say, things that are embarrassing or just 
her own glitches when she's trying to recite her script and especially in 50 minutes she was she was doing it all from memory and then she kept she keeps doing retakes mm -hmm. and then her husband's there saying telling her just yeah just read it over again try again and she's and it's all there right it's sort of a hard thing to achieve these days i think to make something look that kind of naive in a way and pull it off yeah <laughs> not have it be arch mm -hmm. There was a certain awkwardness in her body and her and the haltingness of because of, of the, the thing in her ear, the prompter or whatever it is, that makes it seem quite unnatural and mechanical and but there's something about all of that together that um, and, and it's almost like she's meditating on it and she's really focusing and um, and then and then with the the very casual bringing in of the photographs of the photo album and even I don't know. There's something uh, the blowing of the dust off the books too. is really a poetic moment. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I wasn't sure. I'm still unsure about about the use of the body, but I think it it also shows her in her environment how she makes work, and it and it gives an urgency to um, give an urgency to. The idea of addressing a woman in the domestic space and how that can be something active, and that, and active, and not just, um, you know, because of that history of women being confined to the home and and but you know. But it's also it's also her studio space. Yes, it is her studio and space. So I mean, that's what I love about this little like we just saw her pan down, and then there's like um, this revealing of a microphone or like tech, technology and. Same as her, like reciting. So it's yeah, it's this interesting collision. She's revealing the studio aspect and the personal aspect. Like little hints of it. So that's the beauty of the of photography when it is a stage. I mean, I think she yeah, and and, and the book on notes it, on photography and accident. She she keeps coming back to uh, Godard, saying that if you're if you're making installation. If you're making films that are installations or you're staging the <coughs> cinema, you're just afraid of the real. You aren't able to, to deal with the real head on. And so I think she's she's coming to terms with that, with kind of being the actor, but also being, um, you know, just the artist and using the home as the as the location, um, using books as a kind of a staged or um, constructed component to talking about your real life. I mean, I think she's oscillating between wanting the real and then re and then letting us know that it's all a construction anyway. There's no such thing as very pay. It's always this kind of construction. There's, there's accident, there's choice at the same time. There's, so she's, um, she's trying to complicate her practice. Thing. It's like the text is like the script. Sometimes she goes into the script and comes out of the script. Yeah. But it's those moments of indecision and and love, and then not not reciting something, probably reading it wrong, yeah. that are really beautiful. And the way she leaves it there, um, I think she rehearses quite a bit too, uh, uh, like trying to memorize one script entirely, like this really extensive memory kind of project. But I get, I guess, in a way, yeah, using the home as as the portrait or the stand-in or subjectivity. And the objects in the home. And yeah, it's yeah. Um, again uh, like a a really old problem. I think, <coughs> that she's working with a fresh way. I think. Yeah, there's a nice moment here where they're talking about the um, the two tier kind of. Um, Tombstone, ossuary, and the the feet of the the man. He has these nice slippers on, and then the woman's feet are covered with the kind of cloth of her dress, and uh, and and there's all there are all these these kind of uh, reference to them sleeping. That they're only sleeping. They're not really dead. That they're sleeping, and and every reference is kind of medieval tradition of showing the aristocrats how this kind of immortality. Um, and then it, it also harkens back to Walter Benjamin on his couch, kind of leaning back and resting and not being able to sleep. And um, yeah, these kind of 
beautiful moments where the cemetery is juxtaposed to what Benjamin is is um, is referencing.